So welcome to the Ecological Leadership Program Preview. Um, this, um, the Ecological Leadership Program is a program of Lake Erie Institute, and I'm the executive director actually of a Lake Erie Institute, but we have other faculty members, and if you join the program, you'll get to meet them as well, and not just me the whole time. Um, but I am the one doing this um, preview right now, and I'm very excited to, to welcome all of you. Um, so yes, I am Nareed Brenner. This photo, I'm actually in this photo, photo um, and you, I don't know if you can see me, I'm sort of on the bottom left-hand corner, but I just wanted to give you all a sense that we do a lot when we can, when we do meet up at the retreats, we have four retreats, and I'll tell you more about how that all works. Uh, we, we do as much outdoor classroom as we can, so this is one of our outdoor classrooms, and the person who's the facilitator right here is Dr. Brad Charles Meltzer, he's sort of in the right-hand corner, and it's hard to see him too. And this is our retreat center. It's a beautiful spot in Chardon, Ohio, which is in Northeast Ohio. It's called Resilient Acres. And there's room for people to camp out there, and there's a farmhouse. And hopefully this pandemic will be mostly gone, I hope, by the time June rolls around and the program is launched and we can all meet in person again. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So purpose of the program, yeah. So at the heart of the program is the idea that leadership is about co-creating a new story for the world. And what I mean by that is that we, you know, you, you can't get away from it. We are definitely living in very transformative times, tumultuous times, um, anxiety inducing times. These are, these are, um, these kind of transformations make us all anxious. I mean, they make us all nervous. They're somewhat traumatic even. And um, it's not just in, it's both earth history and in human history and all the old stories that sustained us, um, the belief that, you know, all we need to do is buckle down and work hard and everything will be fine or the belief that we are progressing towards something, um, some, some ideal time, right? Where science will have solved all our problems and um, medicine will have, healed all diseases, right? We thought that that was gonna happen. And technology is going to be so perfect that we will, uh, who knows, we'll have perfect lives. Well, th that story, that story of progress is part of the old story. And it's a status, we really did believe in it. When I was a child, I certainly believed in it. And slowly over time, we've come to realize that, that that's not the way, that's not really true. We do need new stories, we need new mythologies. We knew we need a new way of being, and I, I'm gonna maybe say this more than once, we also need new leadership um, because the future, we are barreling ahead towards the future and the future is coming to meet us. And the new understanding or the new stories that we are all interconnected, we are all part of one whole. And in the old story, we saw ourselves as separate humans, right? Everybody's kind of in it for themselves. Individualism was a value that was um, uh, held up and, and elevated above almost all others, certainly in the United States. We can no longer all live separately. Of course, it's not even true that we're all separate beings. Most of us know, and I'm guessing that most of you who've been drawn to this program do have a sense that we are connected, that we are interconnected, that it really is a story of interbeing. So how do we live with that knowledge? How do we all kind of step into that new story? Well, that's what this program is about. We're gonna be talking a lot about that. We're gonna be talking about how our lives need to change because as we see these transformations that are happening and going on, uh, we do begin to question our lifestyles. We, be, we begin to question how we've been living up till now and we wanna test out other ways so um, that is part of the conversations that we have in this program, part of the ways to figure it out. And we shouldn't be figuring it out on our own. That's um, part of my, or maybe even the, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that we're actually all in this together. We do need community. We need community more than anything else. That I think is the antidote. I sometimes say community is the antidote to empire. The old story was one of empire, right? It was of nation states conquering the new story is one of co-creating in a community, small communities, local communities. And that's where we are today. And that's what we're 
um, all about in this program. This is another, uh, this is from the September retreat for the 2020 cohort. So by the way, um, I am now, you guys are um, being invited to join the second cohort, um, which is the 2021 cohort is our second uh, cohort. So this is, um, I just had to bring it again. It's in the same place that I showed you before, the Resilient Acres, which is a farm, a hundred acre farm uh, in Northeast Ohio. And this is one of our um, cohort members, Stacy. She's doing the sound bath. And um, you're all invited. Everyone who joins is invited, of course, to bring you their gifts and their unique talents and skills. And Stacy's is uh, performing or um, uh, guiding us in sound baths. So we were all kind of uh, lying there on the grass. It was uh, chillier than you think in September this year. We were in the sunshine, but this is late afternoon. So yeah, we're all bundled up, but it was a delightful moment there that she was sharing with us. Ecological leadership is, is a new, it's all about new ways, new ways of understanding the world, new ways of working in the world. And this might be uh, resonating with a few of you because I'm sure, and a few of you have been mentioned in your emails to me that, you know, um, we no longer want to work in the old ways. It doesn't feel right to us. It doesn't feel um, the, the, the old ways, the old systems feel very wrong. And some of us are stepping into new ways of working in the world, but it's scary. It's a moment of, uh, of anxiety because how do you make a living that way? How do you put food on your table? How do you pay your bills in the new way? So we're trying to address that as well. Of course, we can't come up with all the answers. And sometimes it's just um, really just a matter of, you know, taking certain leaps of faith. But um, if we in community can find those new ways of working and also still supporting ourselves, well, that's what we're all about. Uh, new ways of being in the world. It's not, not always about doing, right? It's uh, the old way has been always do, right? Uh, what you achieve, what you accomplish, what, what success, success was always about building something big or new and going big. I, I've um, been in many, I'm a, my background is I have a PhD in organizational behavior and I've taught in entrepreneurship courses and in the, in the institutions and in the academic institutions. It's always about telling students, yes, if you wanna be an entrepreneur, think like you're going to be in the next Bill Gates and he, well, maybe that's no longer the story we have to tell because who's to say anyway that our impact in the world is about numbers and quantity and that we measure it only by numbers. Maybe our impact in the world is doing what's right in front of us to do. The very, whatever it is, it can be small, it can be big, it can be whatever, and that is impactful. We, we don't know in a quantum universe, which is what we're in, um, we don't know what small action we might take or small way of changing something in our lives and what an enormous impact that could have that we can't measure. So I, I tell people to keep that in mind because the way we've measured things in the past no longer really works. And new ways of relating with the world. And that I will talk more about when we talk about the eco psychology um, portion of this program. So um, this is kind of my, uh, what I believe, okay? I do believe we all yearn to be part of something greater than ourselves. Um, I do believe we can do this individually. We, we can't do this separately. We have to be together in creating these circles, gathering together like-minded people, people who are seeing the flaws and the cracks in the current system. And this course honors that yearning. We create community. And that might be the number one thing we do. The, the current cohort, which is finishing up in March, uh, they say to me, we love each other. You know, we didn't know each other uh, almost a year ago when we started out. And today, these are my dearest friends. So creating community is number one, I think, um, because as we change and as we grow, uh, we can feel awfully lonely if we're doing it on our own or trying to do it on our own. Um, the program also gives voice to and process and grieve for the social and economic injustices that we are experiencing. Many of us are seeing how I mean, I, I think uh, this past year or the past four years even have really exposed some of the social and economic injustices. And it's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking. Sometimes it's heartbreaking and sometimes you're outraged by it. And sometimes you just, uh, it, you know, there's, there's everything from anger to grief, to sorrow, to pain for it all. And we do need to give voice to that. We do need to grieve for what we're seeing. You know, when, um, when species are going extinct, 
we need to grieve that. We need to get together and hold a ceremony in order to grieve. And that I, you know, when I started talking about this, I was still in the university system. There's no space for grieving in a university course. I tried to do it, but you know, <laughs> it was unusual. It was, I was looked at like I was weird. <laughs> but when I gather together with like-minded folks like yourselves and we sit in a circle in nature and we talk about this, well, then it feels right to do it. And we, we, we have, to have to give this voice. Um, we have to cry together. So through this journey we discover we, of discovery, we also explore ways that we can heal our connection with the planet and the harm that our economic system has wrought. It's together that we create a community of earth leaders who recount the old story, but begin telling a new story, a new story that has hope and wisdom. And it's gonna look very, very different from the old story. And I, I'm sure some of you already feel this way. You feel like a fish out of water when you're, you're in the old story. And because uh, I know that a lot of the folks who are drawn to this kind of uh, training program already feel that way. Well, here you can be yourselves <laughs> in this program. Um, you, you'll, you'll find that um, maybe your family, I don't know, families sometimes don't understand us. People at work in our workplaces don't always understand us, but here's a place where you'll, you'll find people who do understand. Um, so there are five areas of study. Um, in a lot of ways, this is, so here I am, I'm an, uh, I sometimes call myself a recovering academic. <laughs> Um, but, but I do maintain some of my academic background, so I do um, have, you know, learning outcomes and things like that. Um, I don't give exams or tests or, or you know, or, uh, there is a kind of paper, there's an assignment, but it's more for you guys. I want, uh, I do believe that things should be written down. It begins to look real when you write things down. So there's reflections that I do ask you to write, but not in any we don't give grades or anything like that. So I'm, I'm, that's also for me stepping into a new story of what learning is and what teaching is all about. So these are the areas of study, ecological economics, eco-psychology, an intro to permaculture. And if you're interested in getting a certificate in permaculture, we have connections to certain um, other organizations that give that. We give the intro, but the actual certificate in permaculture, we don't yet do. We might at some point in the future, but right now we do an intro to permaculture regenerative practices, and eco-entrepreneurship. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about each one of these. So if you'll allow me, I mean, indulge me in ecological economics. I know probably a lot of you, when you were in, if you were in college and you took an econ 101 course or class, um, you might have been... <laughs> I, I say this carefully. You might have been bored by it, or the whole thought of economics might bore you. I don't know. I love it. It's my passion. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a tidbit here because I, I actually think it's a lot more interesting than you think. Because uh, conventional economics are all about certain assumptions that are, they're almost never spoken because there's so much underlying everything that we kind of leap right past it. But the assumptions, or some of them I've written down here, are that the economy can grow indefinitely. If any of you listen to, I sometimes listen to NPR, to, to their um, money, uh, I forget the name, Kai Rizdal's the money program. And he's always cheering on every time, oh, the growth, the economy has grown. And you hear that all the time, even on the left, the right, it doesn't matter um, which side of the political spectrum you, you happen to fall on or, or, you know, tune into, they all talk about growth as a good thing. But we absolutely need to question that because that is, it is destructive. Another thing you'll hear is that the markets can solve, solve all our problem or that technology will solve all our problems. Well, I got news for you. It's, they're not, markets are not going to solve all our problems. Techlo technology does not have all the answers. And if we think that the markets are going to solve all our problems, well, again, we won't have much planet left to <laughs> to, uh, you know, to live on. And of course, the final one, which uh, those of you I'm, I'm guessing who are drawn to this are already very much um, will, will agree with me is nature, nature as a resource. Uh, nature is not for us to use as a resource. In fact, we are not separate from nature. So like I was just saying, and I'll sum this up quickly because I, I like to go on and on about this topic, but uh, not everybody else does. But mainstream economics really does not recognize that our planet is a finite planet. We don't have another planet in reserve. The economy as a subsystem cannot grow indefinitely. That's uh, like I said. And if we continue endlessly to extract from nature, 
we will end up paying the ultimate price. So ecological economics also integrates many other aspects. So that's why I think it is a very interesting psychology, anthropology, archaeology, ecology. Um, I think I talked about most of this, how we need to get an integrated picture of how humans have interacted with their environment in the past and how, and, and there are um, lessons we can take from the past. By the way, there were societies in human history who did live in harmony with, uh, with the natural world. And that's, uh, right now I'm talking about indigenous cultures. So we have a lot to learn from indigenous cultures. I sometimes call it, I say we are decolonizing our minds and we are re-indigenizing ourselves, our society. And I, 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 I will repeat that more than once. If, if you come into the program, you'll hear me say that. The decolonizing is very, uh, there are a lot of layers to it. And re-indigenizing also, it's complex. Um, it's not about appropriating any other culture, indigenous culture. It's about um, learning from them, being uh, students of indigenous practices. So um, that is absolutely part of ecological economics. Yeah, so we're gonna look at humans embedded in their ecological life support systems and not as separate from the environment. And like I said, it's not, it's easy to say that, it's not easy to do it, but uh, we will, we're, we're practicing it, we're getting there, we're moving towards that. And of course, ecological economics and this program is about designing a future that cares for everyone. You, you don't know how the stress of living in our very individualistic, very separate culture of feeling like it's all on you to make your living, it's all on you to support yourself, it's all on you. If you haven't succeeded in the system, there must be something wrong with you. I mean, that's the story we've told. So like I was saying, it's about designing a future that, that everybody is cared for. And there have been societies like that in the past. And it's time for us to redesign our, our own society, our culture, our economic system that no one ever, ever should fall into dire poverty and not have access to um, the basic needs, basic needs, health, um, sustenance, shelter, um, education, basic needs. We, we, we are all in this together. We need to provide for each other. It's not about capitalism versus socialism. It's really about just designing a system that cares for everybody. So eco-psychology, and a lot of you um, and a lot of folks who, who are interested in the program are very interested in the eco-psychology portion of it. We spend a lot of time outdoors, a lot of time in nature. Uh, eco-psychology itself is a contemporary movement. It blends psychology with environmental thought. Um, it really says that we cannot be healthy mentally, emotionally, psychologically if our environment, if nature is not, again, because we're not separate from it. So if, if our environment isn't healthy, if our ecological system is not healthy, well, neither can we be. So we, we're seeing so many um, emotional trouble. You see kids with emotional issues, not just kids, adults too. Uh, and, and you know, where is it all coming from? Well, we need to be looking at our environment and the health of our environment. They, they go together, they're integrated again. So practitioners of eco-psychology help others. And we have quite a few on our, um, in our faculty and our, on our staff who help to intentionally connect with the natural world, to increase physical, psychological, and spiritual wellness. We need to start talking more about our spiritual health, but it really is about healing ourselves while healing the earth. As above, so below, they say, or as within, so without. Healing the earth is healing ourselves, and healing ourselves is healing the earth. Those two things flow back and forth with, one, with each other. It's not a separate thing. This is, uh, this is part of our eco-psychology. Actually, this was a, a trip to one of the urban farms in Cleveland, but uh, we were on a little bit of a nature walk. This is an area that was so degraded at one time that nothing could grow there. And as you can see now, everything is growing. There's, so this is a story from this urban farm in Cleveland, which is really a beautiful success story of how um, these folks uh, just revived a, a section of a land that no one thought was possible. And today it's thriving and growing and we, uh, we were able to uh, visit and to get a chance to see the, uh, the amazing work that these people are doing. And of course to learn from it and perhaps apply it in our own ways. We have forest therapy walk. We have a wonderful faculty member, Mary Alice, who takes us on forest therapy walks. And we learn to tune in to nature. We do meditations in nature. We even do a mini vision quest 
if uh, everyone is willing to do that, it really is spending hours um, by yourself, but you're not by yourself completely because uh, we, we keep track of everybody. Um, but in, in a spot in nature where you sit for several hours of meditating, we call it our mini vision quest. And the forest therapy walk comes earlier than that. This is usually at our June retreat. Uh, so the next uh, regenerative practices. So they, there's a lot about regenerative practices and we can't get to everything. Some of the more important ones are how do, how do we revive our waters and watersheds? And Ashley, you were talking about that with, when you're talking about Lake Erie itself um, and how to revive Lake Erie. And we've got some people in our, um, again, on our staff and guest speakers who come in and talk about how um, dams have been dismantled and rivers have been revived. Ecosystems are now being um, brought back to life. We talk about food justice and food sovereignty. Um, I know people are from different areas, but um, food sovereignty is a huge issue. So yeah, Northeast Ohio is not food sovereign at all. Let me uh, continue. So anyway, there's a lot to talk about. Permaculture, green building, renewable energy, um, regenerating the culture, of course, and that's part of what we're doing. Advocacy and activism, which I think I may have mentioned a little earlier too, because sometimes that becomes something that uh, some of the um, members of the group really want to focus on, in which case, yeah, we're there for it. So these are all regenerative practices, and there are folks all over the world right now doing remarkable projects in regenerative. It's no longer called sustainable. The reason I use regenerative is because sustainable is now passe. And I, I, I'm guessing you can even guess why it's no longer the word that we're using. Uh, it's still a word that's recognized. People know the word sustainable. But uh, the problem with sustainable is that we can't sustain it anymore. It's not about sustaining what we have. We now need to regenerate. <laughs> We've destroyed so much that if we call it sustainability, well, what are we sustaining? I mean, we're sustaining a, a, a dying planet. We have to regenerate the planet. We have to contribute to the healing of the planet and not just sustaining what we have right now. Eco-entrepreneurship. So eco-entrepreneurship is interesting. Um, I define it, and this is something, Lake Erie Institute defines it a little differently. If you were to look Google eco-entrepreneurship, you might find um, green energy, green building, uh, recycling, things of that nature. I define it a little differently. I've been encouraging all of us to use eco-entrepreneurship as any venture or any innovation, a method. It doesn't have to be starting a business necessarily. That's what people usually think of when they think of entrepreneurship. They think of starting business. It could be a nonprofit, of course, but it could be any type of organizing that imagines and pursues a harmonious relationship with the entire web of life. So it's not necessarily about making money, although it could be. That's why I want to kind of leave that as an option because I know as more and more of us want to step into the new world, the new story, uh, like I said, the question of how we put food on our tables and how we pay our bills. But I am going to tell you that maybe if there's some passion that you have, some project that you want to get off the ground, we're here to help you do that. And if there's a way to monetize it, then we will try to help you do that. Um, so I want to say this is where it gets very creative and is very different because it all depends on what you're bringing to the table. I had in this current cohort that's now finishing up, that's graduating very soon, there are a few people who have projects that have nothing to do with money um, and don't are not interested in monetizing. And yet others um, who would love to be able to take their artistic passions or their um, gardening passions or whatever it is, and find some way to make a living from it. So my commitment is to try to help us do that, try to help everybody who wants to, to do that. So we do provide mentorship and guidance and tools. If you have an eco-entrepreneurship project that you want, we're here to help you get it off the ground and in whatever ways that means to you personally. Or even if you don't know what it is you wanna do, we're here to help you find that sacred purpose and um, see what, what, how you want to apply it in the world. So yeah, so it's a 12 month program. Um, it leads to a professional certificate in ecological leadership, which is issued by Lake Erie Institute. It's a distance learning, but it's really a hybrid. So we, we meet uh, quarterly means every three months, but I'll tell you, it's, it's gonna be a little different this year. 
um, in the Cleveland, Ohio area in the United States, but because um, we most of the time between those every quarter, we meet on Zoom. So you don't have to be anywhere nearby. You have to be, I guess, uh, driving distance. Um, so um, there are four in-person weekend meetings. So, so four times, but there's actually three. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. I'm actually changing it a teeny bit only because I want it to be easier for those who are a little further away. And because the December, um, I think in December, it's right not to meet in person, but we do a retreat an intense period of time on a weekend that we meet um, pretty much you devote your weekend to the program, but we don't necessarily have to drive in for it because December is the weather isn't always so good. We do have bi-monthly meetings. That means every other week we meet via Zoom. Uh, there are online modules, there's some exercises, there's some assignments, like I said, no grading, um, but we, <laughs> It's uh, it's about it's about the intrinsic rewards rather than the extrinsic rewards, and again, that's that's part of decolonizing our minds because all of us are so used to learning for a grade for that extrinsic reward. But um, this is practice for you know the rewards come from within <laughs> when you write something or you, you offer something to the group that um, that feels good to you. Uh, asynchronous group discussion. We've been using Facebook for it. We might, and most of you, I think, are on Facebook. We may continue on Facebook because I don't want to give you another place to go to, to for the you know a discussion that's sort of ongoing. But um, we can talk about that as a group. There, there are uh, uh, there are other options. Um, yeah, and you get individually mentoring sessions. Um, access to your faculty mentor for support and guidance, always via email, also by phone or by Zoom. Yeah, the program launches June 11th, the, the weekend of June 11th. So 11th is June 11th is a Friday. So 11th, 12th, and 13th would be our first our launch of the program. You'd actually meet the the um, first cohort will be graduating at that same time. So you'll be able to be there at the graduation ceremony and talk to some of them and get a sense of how their experience was. This is from the Riddle, the, 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 um, that urban uh, farm that we, that we visited. Let's see what else. So this is the retreat dates. So the in-person starts June 11th, like I said, 11th, 12th, and 13th. Then there's another in-person in September. That's the next quarter. So we do it on the solstice, close enough to the summer solstice, then close to the um, autumnal equinox. In December, it's going to be virtual. So I said before that we meet uh, in person, but we, we actually do a virtual. And I think we're gonna do a virtual next year because uh, the weather gets a little cold and um, it's harder to be outdoors. And we really wanna be outdoors as much as possible when we do meet. Um, the March one is also could be iffy, could be in person, could be virtual. And then again, graduation. Um, and it'll be June 10th to 12th, uh, 2022. We have got some wonderful guest speakers who sometimes come to the retreat gatherings. Um, we have fire ceremonies. We've got, um, uh, like I said, a, a mini vision quest. We got uh, someone who does works with dreams. She's a wonderful expert on dreams, and she's been doing workshops for our groups on how to understand your dreams. Um, all kinds of amazing um, guest speakers are on our faculty. Okay, so everybody I'm sure wants to know about the cost. So here's the thing, it is $4,200 for the program. There are payment plans. Um, so you can really pay this off slowly over 20 months, which comes out to about $200 per month, a little more. There are scholarships and I'm sure, and some of you have already asked me about scholarships. I have at least 10 scholarships. They're 50% scholarships, so it, it would be half. They are available on a first come first serve basis. I do like to give them based on need. So um, if you are interested, please do request it. It's easier if you get it in sooner, it makes it easier, but I will try to find more scholarships if I can for anyone else who might want. There are also tuition reductions if you've been part of our programs in the past. We never turn anyone away for lack of funds. So again, if, if you have some issue and want to share with me, a little bit about your situation, I will see what I could do to make sure that um, we can make it as affordable as possible for everyone who wants to come in. I don't want to turn anyone away.
Uh, if you want to apply, there is an application form on our website, or you can email me and I will send it to you, the application and the scholarship application if you want it. Great, everybody. I'm uh, thrilled to have met all of you here. I am looking forward to continuing these conversations and maybe uh, hopefully getting to know you even on a deeper level as we move forward. So um, reach out to me and I will, um, I will hopefully be speaking to all of you pretty soon.